uh, I think when you look at an opportunity, often every metric of whether you should do it or not is saying you shouldn't do it. I think that's a trait of entrepreneurialism or, or people that like to take risk or just throw the ball in the air a bit. And there's often just one reason which says you should do it. And that's often I want to try it or, or it seems interesting or I want to challenge myself. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 126 of the Startup Playbook Podcast. I'm your host Rohit Parkova and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have the co-founder and CEO of Zella, Ben Fisterer, as my guest for this episode. I first interviewed Ben on this podcast back in March 2018 when he was then the Australian Country Manager and Head of APAC at Square. Prior to that, he was part of the founding team at Jetstar, led one of the world's first mobile payment pilots while at NAB, and was a head of innovation and emerging products at Visa. In this episode, Ben's coming back on the podcast to talk about his new startup, Zella, which recently came out of stealth mode to announce a $6.3 million seed funding round led by SquarePeg Capital. In this interview, we covered a wide variety of topics, including the inputs of culture, the complexity behind creating simple products, what Ben looks for when he hires, how Zella raised $6.3 million in funding without a name, a product, or a team, and much more. Without further ado, here's my interview with Ben Fisterer. Ben, welcome back to the Startup Playbook podcast, and uh, great to have you back on the show. Hey, Rohit. Uh, thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. So, Ben, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background or may not have listened back to our previous interview, do you want to share a little bit about your background story and what got you here today? Uh, yeah, sure. I think for me, I sort of started out my career um, probably the normal way most people did with uh, getting into management consulting uh, after university and did that for a number of years and quickly realized that wasn't the thing for me, but managed to build up some skill sets in terms of being able to think fast in different industries, you know, form a view quickly and be beneficial to any industry or company. And you know, from that, lucky enough to be part of the initial Jetstar team, uh, learn a lot. Uh, watching some pretty good people scale a business up from from nothing uh, up to a sizable uh, player in the industry, despite obviously the current challenges. And then, yeah, got sucked into the world of financial services and fintech, I guess, before fintech was the name. And I uh, just got addicted to that space and, you know, loved sort of trying to push things like EMV cards originally and then into contactless technology. So I did that at, at NAB for a while, did a few pilots and mobile payments and stuff. Uh, and ran innovation at Visa around the region for a while trying to deploy contactless and getting it Australia up to be a real solid market. And I love that journey. And from there, I went on to look to start my own business and I uh, was lucky enough after doing that to um, get given the reins of Square. So yeah, the first person in country for that. And for six years, I ran that for myself up to about 120 people, I think, by the time I left and looking after the region. So, you know, amazing, amazing journey on that one in terms of, you know, going through a lot of different experiences uh, in, not only scaling a business, but, you know, uh, building up a really solid team and a product in market. And yeah, after six years, you know, quite recently, in the last year, departed Square onto a new challenge and recently started a company called Zella. Uh, and that's looking into the financial services for businesses space, which uh, uh, we've been busy scaling since the start of the year. Yeah, obviously, very keen to kind of talk to you about specifically about Zeller and your sort of story to date uh, and your experience with Square as well. But one thing that you mentioned earlier that I think we also touched on in the first interview that we did two and a half years ago now was, you know, you not really knowing what you kind of wanted to do with your career. And, you know, obviously, you've had such a fascinating uh, sort of journey to, to date. And I'm sure that, you know, obviously, kind of given the current climate that we have around COVID, but in general as well, like, you know, I think a lot of people... Uh, often at a at a situation where they're not really sure what they want to do in terms of their career or starting a business or those sort of things. What were some of the steps that you kind of took to to I guess get those experiences to find out what is the right um, right approach or the right industry or the, or the right type of business for you? Yeah, sure. I mean, we had, the irony of it is we only get one career per se, so we only get to follow our paths that we take one. So. I think for me, coming out of uni, I, I got a little bit sort of cliched in terms of, as I said, following the sort of the blue chip option out of uni and, and getting to management consulting. But I quickly realized that I could, there were so many options out there, what you could do. And for me, it was just, you know, you don't, you, you have to make sure that you're doing stuff you love. It's a cliche, but it's absolutely true. And for me, it was just try things and see if I like them. And if they don't resonate, then move on pretty quickly, which... 
led to me having a pretty disjointed CV at the start, only staying one to two years at any company and just moving on to something different. Uh, but for me, that, that gave me a wide gamut of uh, industries and exposure in the early years. So uh, more than anything, quickly worked out what I didn't like doing. I realized that although I had a few years there, I didn't like the big bureaucratic organizations. Uh, I didn't look like slow moving organizations. I wanted to move in fast environments. And I guess at the risk of sounding a little bit old back then, I think tech companies weren't really the tech companies they are today. So those options weren't clear, particularly out of university, um, but they sort of emerged over time. So yeah, just found my niche into that area where we can move into fast moving technology. And yeah, for anyone looking at that, I think if you don't clearly know what you want to do, just start ticking off the list of the things that you don't want to do. And I found that a good path for me. Uh, but the number one thing I always liked was I just wanted to be challenged. I just wanted to be in an environment where I was getting pushed, that I was feeling uncomfortable, uh, that I was doing something that was completely different. And my job wasn't to try to change people's views and, you know, working around, you know, incumbents' views of sort of steadfast industries or thinking. I wanted to be in areas which were fast, uh, rapidly emerging. Uh, and so technology was a natural thing for me and, uh, yeah, proved to be an area that I love, love working in these days. Yeah, I think, you know, oftentimes it can be, it can feel like a decision is very permanent, but, you know, there's often this kind of feeling about one way and two way doors, uh, two way doors often being that you can make a decision and then if it's not the right thing, you can kind of go back or do something else. And I think more often than not, there are a lot more two way door decisions than I think a lot of people make obvious. You know, I, again, I think one of the things that we spoke about in the first interview was, uh, and you touched on this as well, was uh, your experience in being part of the founding team to help launch Jetstar. But uh, you weren't extremely passionate about the, the airline industry per se, but there are a lot of lessons that you were able to take to, to help you figure out the next step. Yeah, I, I definitely. And something I talk to a lot of people about, you know, whether peers or, or people looking to work out to do with their career, I was, often look at the sort of theory of horizons is that when you're looking at your next opportunity, all you can really see is that next horizon and you're trying to predict what that looks like, whether it's you're about to take a new job or move into a new industry. So you kind of end up kidding yourself or, or sort of fictionalizing what that next step could be like. And then once you step into it, then you realize what it is, but what you're not seeing and you can never see from that first step is what the horizon beyond that is. Um, so yeah, for a lot of people just take that first step and then suddenly all these things open up after that and they can be good or bad or they can be right or wrong. But uh, yeah, people often just look at that first horizon and then make a binary decision about whether it's the right or wrong thing. And I think that's often short term thinking and as long as you can move forward and, try something new, you often find new things beyond that, which you never expected. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast a few times, but so when I first decided to quit my job to start my first business, my friends actually held an intervention for me and they're like, what are you doing? This is, this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and obviously went down that path. But then when I, uh, about nine months ago, when I decided to jump out of my company and uh, go and join AWS, which is my current kind of current day job, I had the similar sort of conversations of like, what are you doing? You know, you've got your own business, you're quote unquote living the dream. Why would you give that up to, to go and take up a job? And it was really kind of fascinating from our conversation two and a half years ago when you sort of mentioned that you were running your own business and then you, you know, took up your dream job with Square. And obviously recently you've left Square and started going back into running your own thing again. Just really curious to know what was that sort of process like for you internally or, or you know, what was... I guess emotionally or, or like what, what were some of the things that you were thinking that, that helped you make the, the right decision at the right time for you? Yeah. I mean, you never know whether you've made it at the right time. That's for sure. Cause again, you're only living one path. I think it, more than anything, there are often signals you, which you can choose to ignore or not that are telling you it's the right thing to do. And I think for me, it sounds a bit wrong, but uh, I think when you look at an opportunity, often every metric of whether you should do it or not is saying you shouldn't do it. I think that's a trait of entrepreneurialism or, or people that like to take risk or just throw the ball in the air a bit. And there's often just one reason which says you should do it. And that's often I want to try it or, or it seems interesting or I want to challenge myself and everything else. And it's often like questions of money or stability or, you know, risk and things like that. They can often say no. And so, yeah, ironically, I think for me, uh, I've always, I've learned to sort of hear uh, when an opportunity feels right. And I think, over the years just back my judgment and give it a go again who knows if the other path might have been better or uh, or more interesting but i'm pretty happy with the choice i've made so yeah i think for, for square it was you know six years was a long time and so that definitely felt right and i was excited by what it held beyond that and even entering into square uh that was an absolute no-brainer that was you know a chance of a lifetime for me to run a business that i had been watching a little bit from afar so 
they both they both felt very right. But again, in hindsight, you can look back at your decisions and whatever you make like yours and you can wonder how on earth did you think otherwise? It was an obvious decision. You're loving your new job or your new career. But yeah, at the time, it can often be really, really hard and be a bit cloudy. But yeah, just follow your judgment and go for it. I think that's a really interesting point to make for a lot of people that maybe haven't had the opportunity to jump out uh, as well as I think from the outside looking in, it can seem like, you know, you're completely confident that everything will work out and it's the right thing, but it doesn't often feel that way. And, and a lot, a lot of it is often, you just, like you said, you know, you just want to try and you just want to see, you don't want to live with the regret of not kind of trying, but you're confident, but you don't have a hundred percent conviction or, or know for sure that the things will definitely work out. It just doesn't play out that way. Yeah. hundred percent. I think if you ask every entrepreneur or, anyone changing careers or even changing jobs about, you know, if you look at this, the scale of things, how many, yes, I should do this and no, I shouldn't do this. Often it's scaled in the wrong side, yeah, particularly starting new businesses. It's, it's an insane idea. <laughs> There's no logic to it whatsoever, but people that want to do it or have to do it have no choice and they have that burning desire to do it. So um, yeah, credit for you, to you for making that chance as well. Well, likewise. And I know that sort of Zell has been sort of operating underground for the last last couple of months and you recently announced a fundraising round, which we'll obviously get into as well. But for the benefit of those people listening that may not be as familiar with Zella or have sort of come across the company so far, would love to find out a little bit more in terms of what you're doing. And I guess from your perspective, why why now? Why was now the right time for Zella as well? Yeah, I think, I mean, when we look at what, what, what Zell is doing is I think uh, it's probably years of watching an industry uh, that we were part of as a team, but working separately where we saw financial services for business, just not changing much at all. It's pretty much the same. We're seeing a lot of movement happening in, in neo banks and digital banks and the consumer side, but on the business side where they really needed that help and really needed things to start changing and, and, and new optionality when they look for financial services that wasn't happening and it's not happening much around the world despite the rapid change happening in financial services but in Australia if you look at it you know there are five very big in, sorry four very very big incumbents that have you know some some good solutions but very very generic and very much the same and from, if you look across their products uh, they don't vary too much and they're not really in our perspective looking out for those businesses so uh, a lot of you know, these business banks or, or, or digital neo banks looking for business or looking after businesses, they focus on debt and lending and things like that, which is, which is fine. It's an important part of many businesses life cycle. But for us, we took a step back and realized that not every business wants or should have, or should be chasing debt in any way. Um, so what do they want? And it was pretty simple to us. And there was three components to that. And that was you know, they've put in a lot of effort to build up their business or the service or their products and get customers in the door and then they need to make a sale. And so can we do it better? Can we offer better solutions for actually accepting payments? And, and for us in that space, we looked at the market segment, probably from a verticalized perspective of if you take a proxy of, let's say, turnover, if you look at business up to $150,000, $200,000 turnover, you know, companies like Square, I'm happy to say, are doing really well offering you know, a sort of an out-of-the-box out of solution um, for those sort of small micro mobile businesses. Then you look at the real top end. Uh, so think uh, Caltics or Bunnings or McDonald's. Uh, they have deeper banking relationships at the moment. So they often just default to processing payments with the big banks, but right in the middle. So probably at 1.5 million Australian businesses and similar in many markets. That's where the majority of businesses are. And you look at that segment and that's where, you know, there's the big four banks and maybe one other uh, that are servicing them from a payments perspective. So we were pretty confident there was a huge opportunity there. And putting together our knowledge of the industry, we knew that payments was still pretty much just all about an ugly box sitting on a, on a countertop, routing a number around the ecosystem. And we thought that payments has been, you know, promising to offer so much more in that space. So what could we do? So uh, we probably looked at the payment side in two parts. As one, can we compete? And we thought we could compete really well, more innovative solutions, faster onboarding, better integration, but then start looking better pricing, things like that. Um, all the things that businesses are looking for today. But can we start innovating? Can we start bringing new solutions in? And we had a massive list within about five minutes of brainstorming of things that payment experience should be doing in addition to just routing that payment. So payments for us was pretty solid. Then we looked at what else do they need? And the second part is, will they get that money in the door? Where do they put it? Uh, and there's just nothing happening in that space. Accounts are really dormant. They're not doing much and they're quite hard to sign up for. I think we signed up to one of the big four when starting Zella and it literally took six weeks and and a fax. Don't ask me who found the fax because it wasn't me. But So it was just crazy. I thought that's broken. We can need to fix that as well. We know we can. And then the, the third part of it is 
once they get that money and they've got it, how do they disperse it? How do they deploy their capital really quickly to start servicing their business, paying staff, paying invoices, paying suppliers? So we knew we could solve that solution as well. So putting it all together in a really you know, tight knit single solution where you can sign up once, you can get all these things to get started, you can get them all to, to, to switch to a new provider or you can start scaling your business. So yeah, Zella was formed about solving that and making sure that we can offer those solutions and just getting on with that business side of it. Yeah, absolutely. And it can often be easy, again, from the outside looking in to assume that you've got like a fully formed idea of what that sort of looked like. To my understanding, you uh, registered the businesses like New Payments Co or NP Co uh, at the end of last year. You know, what did that sort of initial process look like of taking those, you know, five ideas of what the future of business banking should look like on, on a, I assume, a whiteboard and actually sort of put that into action? What was that process? What did that sort of first step look like? Yeah, I mean, we started sort of toying with the idea around Christmas and really formed the business uh, at the start of January. And for me, it was actually having conversations with people. And so I'm pleased to say that, you know, the founding team is super strong. And you know, my co-founder, Dominic Yap, it was a lot about actually just pinging each other um, on weekends and nights and just, you know, brainstorming on that aspect. And uh, I kind of felt a little bit crazy in terms of I sort of saw this opportunity, particularly starting from the payment side and migrating across those products. And I was um, I thought that, you know, maybe I'm too close to this. Maybe I've been in this industry too long or maybe I just want this to happen too much. Is the opportunity really there? And I had, I think the conversation with Dom was the, the first one of many, which were very, very similar where there was, he was just, gave me a resounding, you know, there is an absolute opportunity here. And, um, you know, this needs to be done. There's businesses in Australia that need these solutions. Um, and we think it's also a global problem being faced. And so he was really quick to say, yep, yeah, I'm in, let's do it. So then, you know, many other conversations ensued and then caught up with, with, with David, David Conn. Uh, and exactly the same conversation, we were sitting in a, in a coffee shop and I was still getting used to sort of pitching the, the idea, not sort of pitching, but talking about it and, you know, building that narrative around it. So I would love to listen back to how I spoke to him about it. I'm sure it was clunky and all over the shop, but um, literally within half a coffee, he said, yeah, I mean, let's do this. Um, I think it's a massive opportunity too. And then I started noticing this trend of people really sort of, gravitating towards the idea and uh, I guess confirming my, my focus that, it, that there was an opportunity there. And then once we had Alfred uh, on board, there was the four of us and we just, we just went from there. So it became a bit of a no brainer, but yeah, I think the, the genesis of the idea was really clear from the outset. And I think it was really an easy thing to formulate um, based on a lot of experience and, uh, across the four of us. But um, yeah, I think the hardest thing for us is that the second observation after saying there's an opportunity, the second observation is that's ridiculously hard to do. Like <laughs> effectively talking about building the infrastructure of what could effectively be a bank. So that, and then third observation was that, okay, how the heck do we put this together? But yeah, I think that first part, it was a, it was a no brainer. The three modules sat really well in our minds. So. Yeah, I mean, speaking of having conversations and attracting people to you, I, in doing research for this interview, I spoke to Ben Hensman from Square Pay Capital, just to get context and insight from, from his perspective on there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they mentioned was that they sort of met with you quite early on, I, I believe it was January. And, uh, you know, I think they went through the process very quickly, but um, that's, that's a fairly standard process. One thing that Ben did mention is that historically, Square Pay doesn't really invest in product to product. And... I hope that he doesn't mind you mentioning this, but he um, you know, also mentioned that the initial meeting with you was one of the you know, most exciting meetings that Square Peg had ever sort of had to date. Going into that sort of first meeting from, from your perspective, you know, I, I don't think the founders really sort of get an insight into this sort of lens. Were there particular things that you went into that meeting with or something that you used to prepare? Or like, I guess from your perspective, what, what were some of the things that you were hoping to get out of that first meeting with, with Square Peg Capital on that fundraising journey? That's very kind of Ben to say that because uh, no surprise in saying that it was one of the most exciting meetings I'd ever had as well. Yeah, the funny thing about that meeting, and it feels weird to say this now because it happened super quick, is that I wasn't actually going in there to pitch. And maybe that's why the conversation ended up being so fluid and exciting for both parties. Uh, I, I didn't know we wanted to raise money at that time. Obviously, you don't sit in Square Peg Capital's offices, offers without assuming that's an option. But uh, yeah, prior to that, the intent was actually to build first part of the proposition ourselves and self fund. Yeah. And so we weren't focused on raising money at all when we weren't, didn't have a pitch deck or didn't go in with a particular angle or style or anything. Uh, so that first one was just a conversation and it was really, really exciting. And it was, it was, it was like my first foray into 
talking to people who not only are used to hearing different pitches and can dissect it and ask qualified questions within seconds, but um, obviously you know, having a meeting with Ben and Paul Bassett at the same time, it was just a really positive free flowing conversation about the opportunity. And as I said, they, they have that skill to be able to dissect the, the opportunity and the problem and start asking qualified questions within seconds, if not minutes. So uh, for someone like me, who's been in this space for a long time, just getting to that level quickly allowed me to explain the proposition a lot better. And I got immediate that feeling from them that they saw what I could see as well. So uh, yeah, I think from there that I think we got a term sheet within about 10 days. So uh, again, from going into that office and not actually thinking we were raising money to getting a term sheet, it was a whirlwind, but an amazing one too. Yeah, something else that Ben mentioned as well was that from his impression, you were quite clear on the type of partners that you wanted. And, uh, you know, you did a bit of grilling of, of Square Peg as well in terms of what they would be like to work with. Again, you know, really curious to know from, from your perspective, if there's anything that you can share, what, what was it specifically that you were looking from, from a partner or from an investor to, to come on board? Um, you know, what were the specific characteristics? And um, if you're comfortable sharing, what, what were some of the questions that you asked? Yeah, I think from our perspective, it was a little bit different and I wouldn't suggest everyone raising money should approach it this way, but you know, our type of you know, innovation or solution we're trying to build, we are, we are subject matter experts, experts in that area. So we weren't per se looking for, oh, we need help or we need a, an investor who absolutely knows this space and can work with us really closely to oh, value out in that space. It was more around the fact, well, we actually know what we need to build. It's a massive question about execution. Um, so it was more on that personal side and that connection. Now, I'd heard the cliche many, many times that, you know, you know, invest, having an investor, getting an investor is much like a marriage where you do stick together for a long time through better or worse. So um, for me, it was about connecting with the people in that team and to make sure that, you know, there will be absolute times I need help and the absolute times I need advice and, and guidance and things like that. But I can't at this point predict what that would be apart from the obvious, which is, is raising capital. So it's about... Um, you know, do I think these people are going to be good to work with? I think they're going to understand the, the highs and the lows of starting a business because there's one thing guaranteed, it's going to be hard, it's going to be challenging, there's going to be curveballs, there's probably going to be a lot of problems. Like, are they going to be there with us trying to solve these problems or are they going to turn around quickly and get nervous and, you know, look for an exit or, or, or change the dynamic of our future? And anyone that's met Paul Bassett and Ben, ben the same, they're exactly like that. I mean, Paul's obviously built a business through very difficult times and done incredibly well on that aspect and now building another amazing business in Square Peg. So he understands it's not a straight path through to success or through to your goal. So uh, that connection was really obvious. And it sounds a bit cliche, but people like Paul and Ben, they're really good at what they do, but they're also extremely grounded people. And so it was more like a conversation. There wasn't, you know, you're pitching to me and I'm better than you or know more than you or prove to me. It was just, let's just talk about this opportunity. So yeah, I gravitated to that immediately. So that personal connection was important. Yeah, I think it was really weird that they did, uh, looking back, it was quite strange that they did invest in a company that didn't have product revenue or even a name, let alone a team. So, but yeah, I think that they obviously understood what we're trying to do. So that connection was, was, was from the outset. And once you meet the rest of the Square Peg team, you see that similarities and that mindset and what they want to achieve and how they want to help. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty easy decision. Yeah, I think Ben Ben also added that it seemed like a great big decision for Square Peg, but after sort of meeting you and the team and kind of buying the vision, it didn't really seem like a big idea as well, uh, a big decision to, to make as well. So, so similar in terms of, I guess, finding those personal connections, one of the things that we spoke about uh, in the last interview was, you know, obviously when you were at Square, there is some form of global brand recognition and a brand that's that's built up that's um, you know makes it relatively easy to attract the type of talent that that you would want, and oftentimes uh, you know or sometimes you, you would uh, often find that people were interested in working for Square but they weren't really quite the right fit. Obviously, when you're launching your own business without necessarily having that brand recognition in place, it is a little bit more difficult. And you've already grown to, to 25 people in the Zella team as well within such a short time period. How do you sort of approach building out the team and what are the specific characteristics that you're looking for from the early uh, team members that, that joined the Zella team? Yeah, it, it, it is definitely different from hiring at Square, but strangely, not always immediately more difficult. Uh, I think you generally, without talking ill of anyone that's gone for a job at Square, I think there are a whole segment of people that are going for the jobs there just just for the brand. You know, I want to work at a company like Square, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. 
but ultimately are the right attributes in these people there uh, other than one to it. So when you're starting without a brand, you don't get people saying, oh, I just want to work at Zella. Like Zella is the thing I've always wanted to work at because I probably never heard of Zella before that. So that mission, what you're trying to do, the team you're putting together, the objectives of what they'll be working on, the tech stack they'll be working on becomes really, really important. So I think once you have a conversation with people, it's harder to obviously get their attention. But once you have that conversation with people, I think the attributes that you're looking for are very different, but they shine through in really strong conversations. So uh, I've always interviewed people first in that line of interviews, which is you know often round the wrong way, but um, I think that's important for me and I and often have really long conversations with people just to work out whether they're the right fit. And I think we might have spoken about this last time, so I haven't checked whether it's changed or evolved or anything, but there's still three things that I look for in people. And, these two things are really, really obvious and they sound cliched and easy to say, but hard to find, but uh, they are what they are and they've proven to be, I think when I get these right in, in people where I can locate these, these traits, they end up being real superstars. And so uh, for me, it's about making sure that although my role as a CEO or a country manager should be about motivating people and, you know, making sure that they're geared up and ready to go and their output is high, I find that if I don't have to do that, um, to people and they've already got that sense of drive, that self propulsion, that real motivation, then they're the real superstar. So my job can change to be less about motivating them and more about just creating an environment where they can be their best. So if you can find people with that real strong sense of drive, uh, that's a massive, massive plus. And, and for me and anyone that's interviewed with me, I've asked, often asked that question in terms of where does your drive come from? So if you can get people that have a real strong sense of drive, they're fantastic. And that drive can come from anywhere. It can be personal, it can be upbringing, it can be professional, it can be a chip on their shoulder, or it can be, who knows, it comes from different places, but definitely drive. Uh, I love people who are, the second one, I love people who are confident in their own abilities and prepared to back themselves, but not in a really bullish way. I don't think um, ego or, or, or anything like that is, is healthy in a, in, a, in a startup environment. You have to all be coming in as equals and you can have a great background, but once you enter the proverbial door, you know, yeah, you're all in that together and there's no time for bureaucracy, politics or ego. So if I can get people who are confident, but humble and that strong sense of humility, that's, that's really, really important for us. So I think also when we're, when we're looking for, for people, we also, uh, apart from drive and apart from humility, uh, we're also looking to make sure that they're in the, it, in it for the right reason. So what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to get out of this? So I think when you can get that third one that people have that alignment with what you're trying to do, it's really, really important. And uh, then those three things click, it's a bit of a no brainer when you find those people. And when you get through those three conversations, yeah, they're really exciting. And you, you just want those people to join and be part of the journey. You know that they will enjoy that journey as well. Are there particular questions that you utilize or things that you're looking for in their background that help tease out the, those three specific characteristics? Uh, not really. Uh, it's strange that um, some people, uh, so, some people come with an obvious background, but they don't often tick those boxes. So it can be a bit of a reverse scenario. Uh, so no, not so much in the background. I'm looking for people from different areas. I think they can, they can be ready to take that first step out of a big corporate they can be coming straight up out of training or out of university. They can often have been in a longer career and then be a bit disgruntled with the way it's gone and looking to take, throw all, everything in and do something different as we talked about at the start. So uh, no, I think the backgrounds are always very different, but I think at the end of the conversation, there's always a real obvious binary thing for me is that if they're as excited as I am um, and that you can just sense it in certain people like after if we share our vision and I'm as passionate as I can be about this opportunity if they start feeding off that and bouncing that back uh, that's an absolute game changer but if people at the end of the conversation are still talking about I'm not sure and this and that which is natural and I get that but that's probably a sign that the fit mightn't be there so that natural enthusiasm is something that should shine through at that point. Uh, something else that we spoke about in a previous interview that I know that you've spoken about in quite a few interviews is um, building out the the team culture as well. And, you know, obviously when you're, uh, you know, I assume in, in a country manager role for a company like Square you, and you get the opportunity to build out a team, you do get to shape that on a local level, but you're still sort of feeding into a, a global culture and a, and a team ethos. What does that sort of look like from a Zella perspective as you're building that up from the ground up? 
you know, I guess what are some of the, the things that you took away from Square or, or from some of your other experiences and backgrounds uh, to help you determine what is the type of culture that you want to, to build? And, and again, like how do you sort of define that and what does that look like in, in the early stages of building the business? Yeah, I don't think I've changed my view on this in terms, I don't think you can create a culture. I don't think you can say, this is what they want the culture to be. This is what it shall be. You know, I'm imparting this on everyone and just become this culture. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Ultimately, and I said this before, in terms of culture is just a, is a, is a bringing together of different personalities. You can't define it, but it can create it. So the only thing you can create is the inputs into that culture. And ultimately that's people. And that's a combination of different people coming together. And then whatever that weird mix might be is what emerges as your culture. So if you get the inputs wrong, uh, the output of the culture will be wrong as well. Uh, and then the second component of that is to making sure that whatever starts emerging and those beliefs that you have as a group and the things you stand for, obviously that's fulfilling those and making sure you do that. So there's no doubt Square had a kind of a really strong backbone of culture. It had a belief system, I think, that was probably driven from Jack's belief. But that didn't resonate automatically you know, uh, across oceans into Australia. I mean, it can, it can be there at the start, but again, that combination of people can tear that apart really quickly or build it up. Um, so you can't really just leverage or lean on a culture from something else. So, so with, with Zella, it's just again, getting those inputs right, getting people that want to be around people like the team that's there, that they want to achieve something to, together. They have common ambitions of building something that's never been seen before and taking on this huge challenge and seeing what we can build from scratch together. So, um, yeah, I, again, I talked to Dom about this the other day. We're actually pinching ourselves with excitement that despite this weird year that we're all living in and the fact that, you know, I still haven't met half the team in person, which is very weird, there is this strong sense of culture emerging and I don't think I could hazard a guess as to what it is or define it or put it in this nice little uh, cliche, but uh, it's just exciting. It's just people that are buzzing to be around each other and really, you know, dedicated to what we're doing and uh yeah so for me that's a weird thing to see and i hadn't seen that before because i kind of as you said took that square culture and tried to grow on it um it came from nothing to something and to see that nothing to something emerge is one of the most rewarding things that you can see so yeah i i probably couldn't define it just yet but i know it's pretty strong and pretty positive so far yeah, I, I was just about to say, you know, before we went live, we were both discussing being locked down in Melbourne. And I assumed that a large portion of your team is also in Melbourne and you wouldn't have had an opportunity, as you just mentioned, you wouldn't have had an opportunity to, to meet with the majority of the team. What does that look like from an operational perspective, especially since you're sort of less than a year into, into the company as well? You're still at the very early stages. I'm sure there's still a lot of um, sort of ongoing process improvement and, and those sorts of things in terms of building that up, especially since you're growing so quickly. What are some of the, the mechanisms that you're using to just make sure that both the communication and the onboarding of new team members and, and kind of you're all sort of moving in the right direction during this crazy year where we're all sort of having to be uh, very isolated? Yeah, um, yeah well, I couldn't say that myself. It is a ridiculously crazy time. And yeah, for those living in Victoria, it's, it's nothing short of insane. And we're going to look back on it in a very uh, weird light. There's no doubt. Um, I, to be honest, I probably don't think I'm doing or we're doing it the best we possibly can. I, I, I don't think you could come prepared to an environment or situation like this to say, well, this is how you handle, you know, never seeing each other and being in lockdown 24 seven. So uh, no, we're probably not doing the best we can, but we're sticking to the basics in terms of uh, making sure that we connect every day and irrespective of time and the amount of workload we have, we're always connecting every morning, having a chat. Uh, we're prepared to have a laugh as well. We don't launch straight into you know, what are we doing every day and, you know, why aren't things happening? Why are they happening? It's like just have a chat with everyone, have a bit of a laugh and a bit of a muck around and then we sort of slide into that work. Um, I think probably the one thing that's really generating some real positivity is is the the layers we're putting on top of talent. It's a, it turns out we, we started with a strong, talented nucleus of a team and then just added these people that we'd never met before and are just really strong contributors and then I think people again back to the earlier point are getting excited by that so there's that natural inertia that's happening within the business um we're certainly focused on some things that I think pretty much every company is focusing on at the moment is like listen we've got a lot of work to do we're all working super hard and naturally high performers but just look after yourself as well like you know shut down the laptop put the keyboard away and just walk out outdoors more often uh every day although we only get one hour make sure you take advantage of that and you get out there and you stay healthy and I think 
that's probably the biggest thing we're keeping an eye on that people just from a, a mental health state uh, and then just a general well-being that looking after themselves and it, it's hard because normally you're surrounding these people every day and you can kind of pick up on little signals positive or negative and you can work with them and you can have one-to-ones and uh, that doesn't happen in lockdown and as much as we love connecting on Zoom and Hangouts, you can often miss that personal side of just bumping into someone, having a chat or overhearing a conversation. Uh, so no doubt I missed that. Uh, I think we're probably missing that. Um, as, a, as a team, we're definitely looking forward to the day we can have it. So, uh, so I, in terms of your question, I don't know if we're doing it better than anyone else. We're doing it amazing. I think we're just, I guess, people enjoying working together and just making sure we connect as much as possible. Yeah, I think one of the things that we spoke about in that first interview was you mentioning that you had, you know, had previous jobs where Sunday nights were awful because you were kind of dreading the, the week ahead and, and all of those sort of things. You mentioned that a culture is a lot about inputs. I think it's also a lot about what the company looks like. It's fed down from the leadership in the way that they act and the way that they behave as well. You know, I guess, what are some of the things that you're doing to make sure that uh, you're making it okay for the rest of the team to um, switch off or take that hour off. Um, are there particular habits that you're putting in place for yourself to to get through this period? Yeah, we were pretty strong on this from the start. Where we're not we're not a bunch of kids straight out of university sleeping under our desks trying to build this business. We're actually there's a lot of people that come from different backgrounds, but also have other things outside life, like as we all do. But you know, families, kids you know, events happening in your life that are more important than anything that ever happens at work. And we're always very strong on that. So I can't, really, unfortunately, we get self-driven, propel people. It's very hard. You got to hold them back a bit. So we, there is a still work happening at all, all hours of the day, uh, but we're really strong on that. And I certainly don't, um, you know, harass people over weekends unless it's super important and obviously very apologetic when you do it and only do it if you have to. So um, we're very strong on that, making sure you get that downtime. I think, Probably more than anything in terms of leading by example, this is an easiest thing when you're starting a business is that I absolutely love what we're doing at the moment. I'm, I hate the phrase, but I'm a pig in mud at the moment. This is like the most exciting thing that I could be doing right now in my life. So yeah, I work hard on it and I love every second I can work hard. I know the other founders and founding team are the same. So I think that rubs off on people a lot. Um, so it's, it's both sides of it. It's like when people come in, they realize we're not going to work you hard, but we do work hard. And we enjoy that output and we like seeing progress. So I think that sort of generates a lot more motivation in people. But yeah, I don't, we're definitely not that type of people that are going to, you know, drive people to work ridiculous hours or, you know, if we're seeing them struggling with something, we're not going to push them harder. We're going to support them to be the best they can. So uh, I think those sort of things are no brainers. And I think the whole team is the same. The, the, this founding team, we're, we're kind of similar in terms of, yeah, we've all worked in environments where we didn't love working over the time. So we were all very keen to create an environment and a culture where people actually like it. And to that comment before about, although in Victoria, Sundays and Mondays feel pretty similar these days in lockdown, um, just making sure that you do enjoy waking up every morning, putting your laptop on. It's not a hassle. It's not a deep sigh of regret for what you're doing. I think you've lost the battle if that's happening. And yeah, I'd be devastated to think if anyone on our team ever feels that way. Yeah, I, I definitely resonate with that feeling of every day just feeling like the, the same day over and over again. It's just Groundhog Day. So final, final few questions for me before we shift gears to move to audience Q&A. So for those of you that are tuning in live, um, just a reminder, there's a little Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to submit any questions for Ben. Uh, so Ben, one of the things that you mentioned in another interview uh, about your experience at Square was, you know, obviously Square is such a great product and, uh, you know, such a compelling part of the the proposition was just the simplicity of it but um simplicity is often very complex to to get to that particular point as well i guess taking that sort of ethos or philosophy of, of sort of looking at, at creating a product that's really simple on behalf of your customers how do you think about building out the the zella product what does that sort of process look like for you yeah that's a really good point to to, to draw out because that simplicity i think is the that shines through in pretty much every successful business, they get that part of it right. Uh, whether they're, they're sort of dissecting a really complex equation or a complex proposition and making it simple, and that's the art of what they do. And you see particularly a lot of consumer-facing neobanks, that's often what is winning and why things are succeeding. It's not that they've got more bells and whistles or they do more or, uh, or they're better pricing and things like that. So they're just taking something really complicated and simplifying it in a nice aesthetic way. Um, so no, that is the a massive part of what we're doing and I've taken uh, lots of learnings over the years in terms of putting it into Zella. That's, there's no doubt there's one 
that's the one from Square in terms of the, the how complicated it is. And particularly we're bringing together three quite complicated products um, and making it into one product. So we run the risk of not simplifying that enough. And, and I think, you know, working with the product team on this is that's a daily conversation about the inertia to when you're building a product, a process or a step within the product, it's you want to explain it to the customer. You want to make sure it's so that often leads to more text than you need, more steps than you need. So yeah, we're often just stripping it out. Do you need to have that? Do you, you know, can you live without it? Will people work it out? Is it, are we explaining this because the UX and the UI that we're building isn't good enough? So then we have to explain it. So then we redo something. So no, everything from, you know, onboarding, which we're really proud of the way that's coming together and automated onboarding and AML, KYC uh, type processes, constantly looking at how easy we can do it. Um, setting up a product is that as simple as it makes sense to everyone, whether they're tech focused or not, um, all the way through to when you need support or you need to understand it, how does that come together? And then often, because we know a lot about what this could do, we want to throw features at it and we want to keep building out. Why don't we do this and that? And that, although it's really good and obvious to us, that complexity often kills the product. So uh, I think in the product evolution we're building now, we've still got more work to do on that. And I think we're enjoying that challenge. And ultimately, customers will be your, your test about whether you got that right or wrong. But uh, yeah, there's no doubt that simplicity side of it is something we're super passionate about. Yeah, you know, oftentimes it can be so easy to just keep adding onto things just because you want to provide more and more value to, to your customers or you think that you're providing more, more value to your customers that way. And it can be really easy to kind of talk about simplicity without um, actually executing on that. Can you share what does that sort of process look like for you in terms of when you think about different kind of processes or features? How do you go about prioritizing or understanding what are things that are sort of critical, mission critical, and what are things that can be stripped away? Yeah, I think from a base offering, we're really clear on what we're building, which is for me really refreshing. I don't think there's any doubt on what the base product looks like, some of the base features. So we're not... It's a different type of product where you sort of just got that, okay, I'm going to try to solve this problem and then you just layer processes and things on top. I think from the very outset, we knew what the base uh, product and the features had to look like. So there isn't much questioning there. It's just in the nuance of how you get to each product or feature. Like, you know, you can say, okay, we want simple onboarding, but what is that flow? What is the ID verification process? What is the, okay, if they drop out of the process, how do they come back to it? And so I won't hazard to say that, you know, we've got structured processes by any stretch at the, at the moment. It's very fluid, which is why we're loving our jobs at the moment. So we're not burdened by processes and procedures, but I just think we ask the right questions at the right time. And so we go that first step, right? This is what we're building. And you start building out how that product will, will, will happen and how that onboarding or how that feature will be integrated. And then we stop before we get, like we're beyond wireframing, we're starting to see that more, that graphic representation of the experience. Then we stop at that point and question, you know, can this be done better? Do we strip it back? Do we start again? And then move forward to that. I have no doubt that we'll get uh, to a point where we're growing in market and we look back and go, wow, we really got that wrong. We put too much in or we didn't make it simple. It wasn't clear, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I think that the base proposition is going to be very strong. I think the way we're designing it is very, very strong. So yeah, I think, probably have this conversation in a couple more years and we'll look back and go, we've got to feel those wrong. But um, I think that's okay. I think we're approaching it with the right, right lens of simplicity uh, and making sure it's as streamlined as possible as well. Yeah, we, we might need to bring you back for a, for a third time interview. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned in the previous interview, and, and obviously like conscious that you're at the early stages of seller as well, but one thing that you mentioned was uh, via inertia, every small company will become a big company at some point and you look for the signs and try to stop it or delay it. When you think about, you know, especially since I think when we last spoke, you were four years into the Square journey, you were at about 40 people. Within a few months, you are already at 25 people at Zella. You know, the business is kind of growing and I, I assume will kind of continue to grow at that trajectory in terms of the people that you hire. What are the steps that you kind of think about to make sure that you're able to continue moving quickly or continue to, ab continue to be able to um, stick to that initial vision? And not just the vision, but the, the approach that you take at those early stages for as long as possible with the company. Um, are there particular things that you're thinking about, um, both in terms of either the, the people that you're hiring, but also internal processes or procedures or how you make decisions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's the forefront of making sure uh, in a, that we don't rush towards that point where we've got too many procedures or become too political or, or bureaucratic. And it's really something really hard to 
to control as you go. So, I mean, as you're leading the business, there are tangible things you can avoid, um, excessive processes, too much risk, uh, adversity to risk, things like that. But, um, you know, I don't want to speak ill of Square at all, but it, it, it is the type of company that went through that similar process. And when you know, I joined, there was, I think, globally 350, maybe 400 people, which is still a lot. But for a company that now is four and a half thousand, I think, uh, I didn't notice as much at the time, but I think once you exit an environment, you can see that so clearly how much that changed. Uh, and I think back to the, I guess what you call C-level executives that, you know, I was reporting to the talent that we had, the, the Francois Brugers, the, the Sarah Fryers of the world, like that type of mindset of those people who, you know, incredibly intelligent, incredibly fast moving, a pleasure to work with. I mean, things aren't perfect, but I think when there's early stages uh, what you have is that common sense of that survival sense. And, you know, looking back, it seems obvious the square is a very established business now and it's worth countless billions of dollars. But back then it was like, well, you know, it was still growing. It was looking, all the signs were right, but it wasn't there yet. Um, so I think what that did um, is it just brought the team together to a common goal. We want to build this business. We want to make sure it's a long-term business. It's not just got a great start and a great story, but it keeps growing. It keeps evolving. So there is that, common goal so you're all aligned so it just strips out a lot of that political stuff and just helps you move forward and if there's a problem you solve it together and you solve it together. i think when you're really starting a business that's really evident like at the start like there's just no question there's no time for politics or backstabbing or bureaucracy it's like we are building this together we're in it together Our problems are solved together one of us fails we all fail so let's help each other out then you get to the end states when you got any companies and not specific to square where you got four and a half thousand people it's and it's got that inertia of growth and it keeps building and it's becoming a bigger and bigger organization the types of people in the organization and the mindset has changed from that survival into that let's just keep going let's not upset it too much let's not make too much of a risk or too much of a change so it happens slowly and sometimes you can't see it happening and then at the end of it you're like hang on this is we're all just steady as she goes type thing we're just driving this uh, thing forward and we're not making these big risks we're not taking these big risks and we're not you know pushing forward as one team there's some little things starting to get in, into the cracks and so um, I think more than anything we're nowhere near that at the moment I'm thrilled to say but it's just keeping an eye out for stuff like that and um, a making sure that you don't do it and you don't get sucked into that type of world and um, but uh, also this is every Starting every business, you're learning something new. Um, and it, different challenges will be thrown up. Uh, I'm sure it won't be a, a straight path, but just making sure that, you know, we're all moving together with the same objectives, keeping that politics out as much as you possibly can, uh, making sure that when processes are brought in, they're, they're done for right reasons, not just for bureaucratic reasons. Uh, and ultimately, as we talked, talked about before, you get that mix of hiring right, making sure you're still hiring people who are hungry and people that want to make a difference and want to take a challenge in life and are not just there to, you know, drive the, you know, proverbial ship forward and making sure that they're wanting to make a change and push things. So, um, yeah, I don't think I've got a playbook I'm going to go by, but I'm certainly looking forward to the challenge. And I've certainly seen a lot of environments which I don't want us to become. And um, I'll certainly try hard to avoid that happening. Yeah, I, I feel like we could uh, make this interview last forever, Ben. So I'm going to finish off with one last question before uh, we shift gears to move to audience Q&A. Um, so you just spoke about the togetherness of kind of moving in, in the one direction. You touched on this as well with, uh, you know, when you took investment from SquarePeg as well in terms of them really sort of buying into um, into the vision of, of what it is that you were building as well. And obviously with the team as one of the co-founders, as, as the uh, CEO, what are the things that you do to, I guess, make that really obvious for the team in terms of the direction that you're sort of setting in place or, or the vision? Are there particular things that you do to make that sort of crystal clear or transparent to the team? Uh, yeah, I think one of the, which you don't have to do on purpose at all because it's part of it and also part of it because I love this part. This is, any job I'm in, this is the best part. All of us, whether it's Dom, David, myself, Alfred, we're all getting our hands incredibly dirty. We, we're happy to do whatever whenever i mean hope he doesn't mind me saying this but you know don our coo co-founder you know he's also our office experience manager so he sets up laptops and gets it out to people and makes sure they're purchased he goes online to play a monitor or yeah i'm the same i'm working on anything and everything i think that not having that sense of entitlement or hierarchy is, is key but um again it's not something we're doing to prove an example it's just something we love we love all aspects of the business we know when you 
r- race to that end state and, you know, management is just management. It, it's the fun's gone. So we're clinging on to that. Um, but I think in a positive aspect, that just shows that we have to do whatever it takes to build this business. And there's, it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to be an absolute thrill as well. Um, but we can't get stuck up in, you know, again, politics, bureaucracy. We may have to make sure we're doing everything we can. And, and that starts with everyone pitching in and, and trying as hard as they can to do everything to make the business succeed. And um, yeah, there's no pretense or there's no ego to any of the team at the moment in terms of we're happy to do whatever we need. And if that, if someone reaches out and says they need support with coding something or designing something or reviewing something, then we'll all pitch in and do it. It's not, you're not in it by yourself. So uh, for us, that's the, the obvious, the obvious point. And um, hopefully there everyone comes in with their senior and junior love to see that fact that they're going to work on really experience complex problems, but they're also going to pitch in wherever they can to make sure it succeeds. So that's an easy one for us. Fantastic. On that note, I'm going to shift gears and move over to audience Q&A. So the first question that I'm going to pick out is from Bryce Chi, who wanted to know, what was the aha moment for you that you decided to to do Zella? Uh, hi, Bryce. I um, uh, met Bryce a few times. The aha moment. Um, I think it was always there. I think the, the funny thing was look, we didn't expect this, but probably meeting with our investors um, and said we had so we've got apex capital and square peg capital and those first meetings as we touched on both of those i don't think they said in those meetings we want to invest but they said everything other than we want to invest so i walked out of there going i'm not sure if this is the normal thing but that felt really really positive and then in a very short space of time we had the investment so i think more than anything not so much about the money because obviously money very important it sets the future but the aha moment there was, was saying, well, A, I think every co-founder has probably, I don't think there'd be a, sorry, I don't think there'd be a founder who didn't believe in their product or service, right? They wouldn't do it otherwise. So they, so I think, well, have we got our blinkers on? Are we sure? But coming out of those meetings, we're like, wow, these are really qualified people who understand the space, understand what's required to do this. And they're agreeing with us. And they're saying, yes, this is an opportunity. Yes, you do have the right team. Yes, your approach is right. This can happen if you can execute it. Um, so walking out of that going, wow, it's, again, less about the money. It's more around like, okay, we, we aren't just naively blinkered here. This is a real opportunity that we can do. So uh, I think that were probably the aha moments in terms of knowing at the start that this is an opportunity or, or something that su- could succeed. I don't think we ever doubted that. I think we've been in the space for a while. And for us, it was, it was super clear that that should be the way to move. Um, you mentioned that uh, they, you know, Square Peg and Apex Capital gave you all of the indications that they wanted to invest without necessarily saying that. Do you mind sharing what some of those bits of feedback were or what were some of the things that was that said to you or gave you kind of more conviction? It, the general leaning in enthusiasm was something that I noticed. There was not, and we've all been in bad meetings that didn't go the way <laughs> we want it to go. Uh, and literally the people leaning in, asking these really questions and talking about next steps, there wasn't any, you know, standoffishness at all. Uh, it was all... I think, I think maybe it was less cryptic than I thought, but um, I remember Paul Bassett saying pretty much what Ben admitted before, where he said, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people over the last few years and I haven't been as excited as I think I am with this conversation. So um, I did have a moment saying, well, just getting to know Paul a bit. Does he say that to everyone? And if you know Paul, he, he's certainly a, a really humble down to earth guy. So I don't think he does, but yeah, I think, when, when he was saying that, it was like, okay, we've got something here and this is a great opportunity to partner. Fantastic. Uh, next question that I'm going to pick out is with one of my colleagues, um, Dave Engel, who wants to, uh, who said, with an idea this big, how do you decide what you want to build yourself and what you'll partner slash buy? Uh, hi, Dave, as well. Um, uh, another AWS person. Um, I think... This for us was a bit of a clear one because we are experienced in this space. So we know the different players and the different pieces of infrastructure and who you have to, or who you can connect to. So it was probably about four macro decisions about who we would partner with, um, but they were really clear. So again, one of our real assets is we, we don't go into this saying, oh, we don't know who's out there to provide this service and or what pricing could be. We know the options, we know the pricing, and we know what we should be going for. So it was pretty clear. Uh, to the sort of subtle part of your question about build versus buy or um, lease or whatever the option is. 
I think we always gravitate gravitate towards build. I think we're not looking to quickly push something out there and have a quick win and you know scale the business as quickly as possible and have some sort of exit. It's about building a long term, sustainable, viable business model. Uh, and I think we've got the talent and the foresight to be able to build the infrastructure we need. So we've managed to reduce a lot of those partnerships down to the real essential strong ones. If we believe someone is good in that space and can offer the things that we want in a shorter period, we'll certainly look for partnerships. Uh, in terms of back end side of things, when you look at the front end and you look at the partnerships you can do with payments and the different value add or functionality, we're more of a, a partnership model. So you look at point of sale providers, we don't want to build a point of sale at all, we want to partner with them. You know, accounting systems, we definitely don't want to build an accounting system, we want to partner with them. So um, <clears throat> I think externally, it's a very much a partnership model. And then sort of behind the scenes, we want to build things the way we want. We want infrastructure that we can be proud of. Sorry, it's what Alfred says. Um, yeah, and so we do a lot more of the heavy lifting in the back end. And we're happy to do that over time as well. We don't have a short-term objective on that. I think that was something you mentioned in our first interview as well, in terms of how Square um, was kind of looking at building out that product, especially in Australia, of just not trying to grow as quickly as possible, but really building those solid foundations and thinking about the long-term uh, viability of, of the business rather than just trying to move really quickly. Final question before we wrap up this interview is submitted from Anup Chaudhary, who says, thank you, Ben, love the sharing. Can you please talk about the key roles you filled as you took it from an idea stage to a product stage? And what are the key steps along the way? I think from a roles perspective, we started just a pretty simple model and just got sort of top down in terms of getting key hires in. So our first five or six hires were pretty senior in terms of you know, maybe not always experience or age or anything, but making sure that they were the people who were going to drive the business and could build teams out. So we looked at all the modules. So we're lucky enough to have, you know, obviously David and Alfred who are, lack of a better term, CTOs in their own right and been built payments and financial services and banking solutions for years. So we had two of them, which was huge. Um, I shouldn't talk about it as them, but um, we had two real assets in, in, in Dave and Alfred. So our engineering team could build out from that. And then apart from that, uh, we looked at risk and compliance. We looked at marketing, so not just the traditional sense of marketing, a broad scaling marketing, product-focused marketing role. Uh, product, of course. Uh, we're looking at that across uh, the two sides, so lack of better terms, issuing and acquiring or payments and banking. Uh, what else are we looking at? So we haven't gone more that customer face, facing and growth yet. So the sort of customer support side of things, sales and strategy, we haven't gone with. Uh, another one was finance. We wanted to make sure that uh, we were really tight on those compliance and finance side of things. So whilst in the first few years we'll be a kind of a fast moving startup, we're entering financial services and you don't muck around with that stuff. You, you can't pretend to know what you're talking about. So we're very much building a stable business there. Uh, and so we had that early hires, we want to make sure we've got that talent right so we can build a, a business which is ready to be regulated or ready to apply for licenses. If Even if we're not doing it now, we want to do it in the future. So we've got those right. Uh, and now we're building teams around those people. And we're starting to see a little bit of evolution. We don't sort of set the jigsaw out and say, the roles must look like this. As we hire talent, they often merge into other areas and have assets we never knew they could. So we change the next hires. And so it's very much evolving. Fantastic. Uh, on that note, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, for those people that maybe want to find out more about you or Zello, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, firstly, come to our website, have a look there. It's, it's pretty simple at this stage, so apologies, not too much information out there. Um, yeah, if you can't get it from, there's a few contact points on there. Um, we're certainly hiring rapidly. Uh, so we're 25, I think we hired about seven people in the last fortnight. So uh, at the risk of pitching, if you're super talented, you love what we're doing and you want to join us, so we'll have a chat about that to see whether we fit. Um, then yeah, reach out, any channel, LinkedIn, direct. We've got a recruit website as well. So yeah, looking for a lot of talent. Fantastic. I'll make sure I'll add those links into the show notes for this interview at startupplaybook.co. Once again, Ben, thank you so much for coming back on the show uh, and for sharing experience and insights. Pleasure, Rohit. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to episode 126 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back at 8 a.m. next Tuesday, the 1st of September with another live episode. And my guest for episode 127 is the co-founder and CEO of BuildKite, Lachlan Donald. Lachlan has over 20 years of experience as a technologist, including being the founding CTO at 99designs. 
He is now the co-founder and CEO of BuildKite, which recently announced a $28 million Series A funding round led by OpenView, which provided a 42X return for its early investors. I'm really excited about that interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.